Thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, on the part one of the regional parliamentary track. Um, this session is titled Where Policy Meets Technology, and I am very honored to be surrounded by a lot of very smart men uh, that have a lot to contribute to the, uh, have contributed a lot to the, development of the internet uh, that we now treasure and support. And I am very happy to have the microphone and hold them with the times, you know, if I manage to, to do that. So, um, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Sabe Bosea, the Regional Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement in Oceania for ICANN. Um, Sabe is, uh, you know, well known by all, all of the audience here and uh, has done tremendous work to uh, bring people together and contribute to the development of the internet and having really interesting conversations in the Pacific about the challenges that the Pacific has and its connections with the rest of the world. So um, I welcome um, Sabe's presentation, so please go ahead. And you have seven minutes. Um, thank you, Sylvia, and um, hello to everyone online and uh, here in the room. Uh, so when we got the brief, we were told, okay, can we talk a little bit about ICANN for the first part? So here it is. Uh, you know, I wanted to bring us back to the mission of ICANN, uh, the Internet Corporation for Send Names and Numbers, uh, to ensure the stable and secure operation of the Internet's unique identifier systems. Uh, and we coordinate the allocation of the assignment of names in the root zone of the domain name system, the DNS, and coordinates the development and implementation of policies concerning the registration of second level domain names uh, in generic top level domain, uh, GTLDs. We also facilitate the coordination of the operation and evolution of the DNS root name server system. Um, coordinates the allocation and assignment of top most level of internet protocol numbers, the IPv4, IPv6, and autonomous system numbers uh, through to the allocations made to the original internet registries and also collaborates with other bodies as appropriate to provide internet registries uh, needed for the functioning of the internet as specified by internet protocol standards development uh, organizations. So in, in uh, ICANN, it's really about coordinating the partners to help make the internet work. It's about protocol parameters, uh, names, registrations, and the internet protocol numbers. Uh, with our technical partners, uh, here on the uh, slide, you can see a few names like the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, that uh, uh, within their forums, they discuss about the RFCs to the Internet's request for comments standards. And uh, we've heard that uh, governments also have a role in there. They participate in one of the, the sessions uh, at the ITF and also have the um, regional Internet registries, uh, the five uh, RIRs, root server operators, and um, the World Wide Web Consortium and others. Here's other partners that uh, we also collaborate with, uh, and, and those like especially the IGF, uh, the Diplo Foundation, Internet Society, uh, the UN. And, um, you know, it is uh, a, co a community that uh, we bring together so that we can help make policies within the ICANN ecosystem. So within the ICANN ecosystem, there's also three parts, the community, the board, and the organization. Uh, within the ICANN community, uh, this is volunteer-based open collection of global stakeholders that uh, includes businesses, internet engineers, technical experts, civil society, governments, and users, of, and many others. Uh, we have three supporting organizations in ICANN uh, that uh, are representing the community from the numbers community for, for IP addresses, the ASO, the address supporting organization, uh, the GNSO, the generic, uh, for, for the generic name supporting organization, um, and also for the country code top level domains, uh, the, the CCNSO. Um, they develop policy recommendations in their respective areas. And uh, we also have uh, four advisory committees. Uh, one is the, the government advisory committee that uh, is the GAC, where all governments uh, can participate and uh, provide advice. Um, and also um, the other, uh, other uh, advisory committees are the root server operators and the internet security uh, experts. So we work together through a bottom-up process uh, 
to give advice, make policy recommendations, uh, and conduct reviews and propose implementation solutions for common problems within ICANN mission. Um, with the board, it's made up of uh, members uh, who are representatives from the community. I'd like to give a shout out for Edwin, who is on the current board as well uh, today. Um, we pro they provide a strategic oversight uh, for the ICANN org, ensuring the organization acts within its mission and operates effectively, efficiently, and ethic ethically. Um, in accordance with the bylaws, the ICANN board approves community policy and directs the ICANN org to implement. Um, within the ICANN log itself, where I'm, I'm a member of, uh, we are led by our CEO, um, and uh, we have staff in uh, 40 uh, countries. There's about uh, uh, five uh, offices, and um, ICANN will be 25 years this year, um, and, and focus is really on the policy development support, event management, registrars and registry support, and, and community support and also uh, contractual compliance and the IANA functions. Um, ICANOG implements the community recommendations at, at the direction of the board under the supervision of the CEO. And ICANOG is committed to uh, accountable, transparent and inclusive uh, open operations and engagement in cooperation with its partners. So some of the things that ICANN does, um, the domain name system provides addressing by the internet so people can find websites, send email and other tasks. Um, within the policy development, uh, ICANN supports uh, inclusive, open and transparent multi-stakeholder bottom-up uh, consensus-based policy development. Uh, we have a function also as uh, one of the root server operator. Uh, there's 13 root servers uh, that are available for the internet and ICANN manages the L route. And we work with the ISPs and uh, telcos around the world to also provide instances for, for those that are interested. And um, we support the growth of the community as well in ICANN. Uh, when community members come in, we help nurture and through fellowships program, uh, also to support stakeholders in their participation in ICANN. Um, I can also manage the uh, DNS top level domains. Uh, I can help provide uh, competition and choice in the GTLD market. Well, with the country code top level domains, uh, I can all delegate top level domains uh, identified with the country code uh, management uh, that is done at the national uh, CCTLD level. With the IANA functions, um, you know, the IANA does the protocol parameters registration, the registration of the internet protocol addresses, and also for the root zone management. Uh, from an end user, there's uh, multiple ways they can look at ICANN, um, you know, uh, for, for the DNS, it allows you to easily neg navigate the internet and I can monitor for compliance with contracts, including review um, of the complaints. Uh, I've talking about, uh, spoken about the root server uh, that helps keep the DNS stable around the globe and also support for the internet community that uh, comes into ICANN. Uh, just my last slide, uh, I wanted to share how uh, internet protocol addresses are distributed because uh, from the IANA functions, that are, these are distributed to the five regional internet registries and they set policies uh, uh, around uh, in their regions. And uh, for that, they, they provide it to ISPs who are members and the ISPs provide it to, to the businesses and customers and then uh, that gets onto the devices so that they can connect on the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sawi. Um, I think that um, having a conversation around what I can do to begin with, to understand how others connect into this space is a very good um, starting point for the next um, speaker. Uh, I, I hope Nigel is connected uh, online. Can someone confirm if he's connected? Is he? I hope okay. so. <laughs> Thank you. We can see, can't see you from where I am. So apologies for, for that, Nigel. Um, so with that, please allow me to introduce Nigel Hickson, Head of Internet Governance of the International Directorate Department for Science, Innovation and Technology of the UK government. Nigel is currently working on internet governance policy at the UK Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, the DSIT, where among other roles, he is the UK representative on the Government Advisory Committee at ICANN. Uh, he joined the civil service in 
1982, and Nigel has worked on a number of policy issues, including secondment to the CBI and working for the Minister of Telecommunications in Bermuda. I didn't know that, that's, that's interesting. From 2012, he worked at ICANN in Brussels and Geneva before returning to the UK government in 2012 to work on data protection issues. And I was very honored to serve on the MAC at the time that he was still there. So he's our great colleague and friend. And I'm sorry you're not here in Brisbane with us, but I look forward to your, your remarks. Thank you, Nigel. You have seven minutes. Thank you very much, Silver, indeed. And uh, I, I, I also uh, <laughs> am disappointed not to be in, uh, not to be in uh, Brisbane. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. That's always a good start. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk today. And uh, I would have loved to have been with you. Uh, I've never been to Brisbane, and it would be a, a real pleasure to be there. And, and thanks to our Australian friends for, for this in, in, invite. Uh, I'm, I feel very privileged to talk to such an august uh, audience. And when I looked through your program and saw all the important people that you've had speaking to you in, uh, in, in the last couple of days, I, I, I think it's a real testament to the, to the importance of, 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 of this event. I, I bring greetings from the, from the UK government, uh, which uh, like uh, Australia and many of the countries represented here is a, uh, are great champions of the open and global internet and, and recognize the, the real uh, benefits that the digital economy brings us. Uh, as Sylvia said, I work in a team in the, uh, in the, in the Department of uh, uh, Science, Innovation and Technology that works on internet governance and uh, digital standards, uh, including standards for emerging technologies such as AI and uh, quantum computing. As, as, as noted, I've, I mean, I've worked on technology issues since the 1980s. It was, uh, you know, great back then. We didn't have to mention the internet. We talked a bit about the information society, but uh, 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 clearly we've uh, uh, come a long way. In, in, in the next, you know, few minutes, I hope to convince you of both the importance of government's engagement in, in digital standards and also the intrinsic link and the importance that we have this link uh, between internet governance and, and, and digital standards. And it, it's, it's, it's so, it, it, you know, it, I really must say that I'm just so, I always get emotional when I, I, I think about the progress we've made in the Internet Governance Forum. And when I saw Anya, uh, you know, introduce, uh, introduce this session, it really struck me, the, you know, the incredible distance we've come since uh, we set up or since the IGF was set up in, in, in 2006. And, you know, today, you know, we're talking, we're discussing internet governance and digital standards in Brisbane, but there's also discussions happening in Tanzania, Tanzania, Tanzania and, and Cameroon as well on, on, on these same issues. It's, it's just so, so inspiring. So firstly, what is the what is the role of governments? Well, you know, standards are, 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 are a critical aspect of the government's ambition to ensure that the government's framework for digital technologies is rooted in democratic values and that technologies deliver for all. They are important elements in a thriving science and technology uh, ecosystem. I think there is increasing recognition of the real world impacts of digital standards. For example, the potential for digital standards to benefit the global community, impact cybersecurity, and embed different value systems in the development of technology. But we also see where standards, internationally recognized standards can do potential harm, such as some standards being developed on end-to-end -end encryption that potentially could undermine our, our efforts in, in having a, a secure, open internet that serves the benefits of all. Thus, governments have a role in ensuring the development of digital standards and governance of standard developments organizations are robust, transparent, consensus-based and inclusive. Working together, governments can make the global multi-stakeholder-led standard system more resilient, effective and open. Our objective is to strengthen our international partnerships with a broad range of partners and work together to be more pro proactive and effective in global SDOs. Our joint engagement will 
more effectively counter the efforts of stakeholders who promote authoritarian approaches over the multi-stakeholder industry-led open and transparent model. Importantly, we will seek to ensure that industry stays at the heart of the global standardization process. We oppose government impose approaches that seek to fundamentally reshape the standards ecosystem. This includes countering attempts to gain undue advantage in SDOs. We must be democratic. We must have standard development organizations that are democratic and multi-stakeholder in, 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 in essence. So how do we achieve this? Well, we achieve, the, achieve this through a two-pronged approach. Firstly, by enhancing intergovernmental coordination, bilaterally and multilaterally. And second, by building our strong networks of international stakeholders across the industry, civil society and technical experts. We need to be a consumer. Governments need to be a consumer and ensure our procurement processes directly adhere to the standards from the standard organizations we seek to influence. It's no good governments preaching about digital standards and then not using them. We also need to support coordination between SDOs, making sure that this happens. However, the global digital standards complex it, landscape is complex and there are different barriers to participation. And thus, we must do more to ensure that stakeholders, including large multinational corporations, engaging in standards is resource intensive and difficult, but we must ensure that all stakeholders have a role in this, in this space. And it's really great to be able to work together with other countries such as Australia and organizations like the IETF and the ITU and in other organizations to ensure that this vision is, is, is taken forward. So finally, Madam Chair, if I may just finish on this link between the digital standard space and the internet governance agenda. And I think this is crystallized by the work that ICANN does in this area and other organizations. These things are linked. We see, and this was mentioned earlier, the Global Digital Compact coming along, which mentions digital standards, which mentions internet governance, the importance of us being involved in this process. And I understand you heard from the tech envoy earlier. I tried to wake up actually and hear his speech. So for some reason I didn't. It was, I think, about two o'clock time in the UK, but I, I, I'm sure the tech envoy who is, uh, you know, incredible uh, force for influence in, the, in this area. Uh, spoke to you uh, this morning. Uh, so not only the global, global Digital Compact, but we have the WISIS Plus 20 review process. It seems only yesterday that back in 2000 and 2000, 2003 and 2005, we gathered together to discuss the information society and how we could come together as governments and other stakeholders to shape the information society for the benefit of all. This whole process is being reviewed in, in, in 2025 at the UN, and we must work together to ensure that the benefits that we've seen through the WISIS process, uh, that the benefits that have been forged by the ITU and other organizations uh, uh, continue. Uh, and I know I've gone over time, so I'll finish there. And I want to thank you for having me. I also want to thank my friend Ian, who I see in the, in, in, in the room, Ian Sheldon, who's a great colleague of us in London. I'll stop, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> I was just holding the microphone to, to start I... calling you. <laughs> Thank you for avoiding me that pain. Um, well, I, I would like to start making the connections between the, the presentation that Savi just made and, and ask the audience to start thinking about the questions uh, that we are coming in the next uh, few um, parts of the panel around the dialogue with, with all of us, around how the, all the voices, if all the voices that are part of this community have been heard, we heard a little bit about ICANN at a global level, presented by someone from the Pacific that knows about the barriers that Nigel mentioned in participation in standards. And uh, one point that Nigel made that is very critical, which is about grounding those standards in procurement to make sure that the government is a consumer of the standards that it supports. So with that, I'm going to pass on to private sector uh, representative here, uh, dear Bron, that is going to speak about um, 
his experience, uh, sorry, lost the file, as chief executive officer of Fastmail. Um, Ron is the CEO of the global privacy focused email provider Fastmail and chair of various internet, inter, internet engineering task force groups, working groups at the ITF. He's an advocate for digital privacy with a passion for open standards and open software. So over to you, Ron, you have said. Great, minutes. thank you, Sylvia, and thank you for having me here. This is my first time at something like this. So I really had no idea kind of what level to pitch this to. Uh, obviously my background working in the private sector in a small company, Fastmail's 50 employees total between Australia and we now have an office in Philadelphia. We bought an American company back in 2015. We focus obviously on our user privacy and protecting user data quite a lot. So dealing with the legislation and the how we fit in that world. One nice thing here, a claim that I like to make about Fastmail, which is totally true, is we have more than 100 customers in each of more than 100 countries. So it is likely we have customers in most of the countries that are represented in this area. Um, and so obviously we have to operate in all the different legislative environments that, that we're in here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the challenges involved in that and some of the things that as a private company trying to operate in all these different jurisdictions, things that are important to us. Uh, obviously, I'm very keen to have questions about some of this too. So I've been involved a lot in calendaring and email standards. Fastmail started out as an email company. We've been doing a lot of email work as well, a lot of calendar work as well. Uh, it's been good to see more people from government coming to IETF, which is the standards body that I am involved in, in the past few years and just coming to understand some of the work that happens there. IETF is where email and calendaring standards have been formed. And this is, as we say, email is the one true global social network. The openness and the ability to contact anyone anywhere with email is something that's really valuable. And so one thing with standard legislation, an example I like to use that's maybe less technical is for mobile phone chargers. A few years ago, Europe said that mobile phone chargers, they mandated basically that they had to be compatible. And so everyone standardized on micro USB, which is great, except that's now mostly been replaced with USB-C. But at least mostly now I can plug my phone into a charger anywhere and it just works. It's not every single phone model has a different charger. This, I didn't draw out the nice pretty picture of kind of you've got a hundred people here and a hundred different providers here. If you have to talk a different protocol to each that crossover number of lines is just totally impossible. So you need to have standard ways in the middle to make that work. Um, on the other hand, yeah, you, don't, you have to make sure your laws don't stop progress and say micro USB will be the standard forever and all new devices must support this even though it's, it's no longer useful. Also wanted to talk about standardized formats. Obviously we have a short amount of time here. Things like Google Takeout's an example a lot of people know that you can get your data out, but if it's in a proprietary format that no other tools know how to read, that's kind of useless. So the thing I love about open standards in particular is that certainly with the ITF standards, anybody can download them, anybody can read them. You do have to read English, uh, but other than that, anyone can, can read them, understand them, implement them. And that's really important. ITF is meeting here in this building next year in March. So if you have anyone in your government who would benefit from being here. It's definitely worth checking that out, registering it. Most of the IETF sessions are online on YouTube, so you can go and see what it's about as well. Um, tech update life cycle is something I also wanted to talk about. Um, and the specific thing here was daylight savings is a great example. That if you mandate that daylight savings is going to be shifted within a week, a month, it's not enough time for people's systems to update. And what you'll wind up with, even within your own citizens, is that some of their devices are in one time and some are in another time. Consider the rest of the world as well, that are much less likely to care about updating for your country um, and rushing the updates through, but it means that anyone trying to interact with people in your country is going to have issues there. It takes time for the changes in your rules to propagate through the world. And it's really worth considering how much advance notice you give and this leads into taxation. Uh, as a small business selling into large parts of the world, we don't have a thousand person legal department and, and finance department working on the taxation rules in every part of the world. 
if you do something like declare a tax holiday where the taxes aren't charged for a week or a day, that is a ridiculous burden on anyone who's trying to interoperate with your country and maybe has a hundred customers there to update the tax rules for that day. So again, advanced notice gives us a lot more capability to deal with something like this than discovering all of a sudden that we need to, to deal with fast moving changes. And the more difficult it is for small businesses around the world to sell to your citizens, particularly the less likely they are to sell to your country. They'll just decide it is, it is too difficult if your legislation, if your rules are too different from the West, rest of the world. Um, privacy is a whole big area. Privacy is something we care about particularly. And likewise, if it's unappealing to sell to your customers because it, to your citizens because it's too difficult, uh, then we'll, we'll just decide not to sell there. Um, privacy protections obviously are really important for people. One of our big challenges is where places say, you must store data inside our country for our citizens. That is almost impossible to deal with. For the really big companies, they can manage it. For a smaller company, it's, it just raises the barrier to entry so far that it, you can't do it. Um, multilateral law enforcement is what we mostly work with. Um, we, we, I mean, we have information from people who are in a bunch of different countries. And unfortunately, some of them do break the law in their country. Uh, in that case, it, your law enforcement need to be able to follow the trail. And so there needs to be a process. There are multilateral law enforcement agreements for Australia with most of the rest of the world and the Cloud Act, which is going to land at some point um, between Australia and the US, it's been delayed multiple times, has some safeguards in place, which are really good. It requires that all the correct boxes are checked while still allowing law enforcement to follow the trail through the world. And it's a whole big challenge that I know everyone is really struggling with um, in the world at the moment. And it's, it's much more difficult the other way into the US than into Australia, but it is something that we're certainly looking at and dealing with as well. Uh, but yeah, try not to force mandate that the data is stored in your country. And likewise, try not to have privacy laws that are too different from the rest of the world uh, because it makes it really hard to deal with you. And that's what I have. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Ron. Um, I think that uh, you have made a great um, work of grounding those examples, practical examples about what standards in practice use in the, what the impact of following them or not following them in the lives of people. Sometimes we struggle to get that practicality into our lives. So thank you very much for that. So now we go to my boss boss, <laughs> Paul Wilson, Director General of the Unique. Um, he has been working on internet development for uh, over 30 years, uh, including more, more than 20 uh, or about 20 as head of the APNIC. Uh, the regional internet address uh, registry for the Asia Pacific. Um, I can't speak highly of this man because I respect him very much. Um, and I, I really welcome his address to try and bring it into the numbers community. Thank, Thank you, you Sylvia. Thanks everyone for, uh, for being here. I'm um, sort of quite used to giving um, presentations about how the internet works, but uh, even in the area of addresses, it needs a lot more than seven minutes. Um, this is more about um, why the internet works or why the internet is so successful. And I hope it's, um, it's of interest. Uh, a bit of, just a bit of prehistory here. Um, the internet, if, if we define the internet as the adoption of, of the internet protocol IPv4, it, it, that happened in 1983. So we've had 40 years since IPv4 was adopted officially. 10 years later, we had the World Wide Web. Uh, 10 years later, we had uh, the World Summit on the Information Society, which, um, as I mentioned today, uh, discovered the multi-stakeholder nature of internet governance and, um, from, and launched the kind of process that we're in, we're in at the moment. It's been going on for a good uh, 20 years since then. So that was 20 years ago. It was a discovery, internet governance. It wasn't an invention of the WIGIG or of the WISIS or of the IGF. Uh, it was a discovery that the reason for the success of the internet was 
the way that it was managed through this or governed or coordinated or, uh, through this multi-stakeholder model. Back in those early days um, of, of internet governance, when it became a, a, a forceful, trendy discussion, the focus was mostly on IP addresses and, and domain names. Today, it's much, much more extensive as, as we've seen uh, this week. It's all about uh, principles, norms, decision-making procedures uh, that are being developed or proposed, uh, attempting to shape the regulation and use of the internet. But uh, in amongst all of that discussion for 20 years, in the meantime, the internet has, <coughs> excuse me, has continued to prosper. There are some. There are also some good examples of sort of of fairly um, major fundamental changes that happened also during that time. Uh, we've got the uh, IANA stewardship transition, which just just deserves um, mention here. Um, the uh, original idea of establishing ICANN was to transition the IANA uh, by no later than uh, September the 30th, 2000. It actually took until 2016, 16 years later, for the eventual um, transition to happen. But it did happen, and it and it is an example of multi-stakeholder internet governance in practice. It happened during this this 20 years without an interruption or, a, or an effect on the actual uh, growth or success of the internet. So over 20 years, since 2003, the internet's grown from 0.8 billion to 5.3 billion people. That's happened under the watch of the current multi-stakeholder model, of course. Now, um, it was during uh, COVID actually that um, there were discussions at LACNIC and between LACNIC and uh, discussions at APNIC and between us and LACNIC, our, our counterpart in Latin America, uh, to see whether we might do some, uh, some work on uh, exploring the success of the internet. There was a lot of, there's a lot of, of talk about the idea, the internet's idealistic model of a single global end-to-end -end network that, uh, that allows anyone to connect to anything. It's unfragmented, it's uniform, but we all know that's not actually the internet. The internet doesn't obey, in fact, it doesn't strictly obey every one of those original sort of ideals. And so we felt that sort of promoting these ideals was a little bit uh, as, as, as if they are um, you know, realistic goals was a little bit uh, misleading. And we, we decided to commission a study on the technical success factors of the internet today, what actually amid, among all of the, the incredible uh, diversity of the internet, the, the speed of growth, the, um, the uh, kind of decentralized chaos of the internet, why and how is it so, so successful? So that's, that's what I want to take us through very um, briefly today. And I know uh, I, I may not even hit the end of these slides before Sylvia gives me the goal. But uh, we commissioned a study by a group called Analysis um, Mason, um, and they and it's available online. There's a, a link there, and of course it can be it can be given to you in a in an electronic form if you're if you're interested. And that study was, as I say, to look at what actually realistically is making the has made the internet successful. And they really started from from the beginning, um, from you know, a zero base to look at at what it is. And they came up with four dimensions of success, which I want to talk about here. The internet has been um, scalable successfully to meet the increased demand from users and for usage. It's been flexible to adapt to new network technology. So the underlying infrastructure on which the internet runs has, has transformed dramatically. And yet the internet is still the internet and hasn't actually changed while all of that underlying technology has changed multiple times. It's adapted to support new applications, as we all know, the things that we know and, uh, and love about the internet, all of the new uh, tricks and tools that we can use have been supported by the internet. This is where maybe the, the definition, what we see as the internet is kind of different for those of us from the technical community who see the internet as that, as that layer rather than the, everything together. Um, but taken together, the internet also as a whole the internet as a whole has been resili highly resilient to shocks and, uh, and changes. So this, 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 this was the outcome, the dimensions of success. And they, they went back to, uh, in a couple of stages, uh, back from there, um, number one, to guiding ideals of openness, simplicity, and decentralization, which really were um, central to the internet's uh, development, to the culture of the 
of the internet's development to the culture of the IETF, et cetera. Openness, simplicity, and decentralization. So guiding, guiding ideals, ideals, mind you, uh, leading to design principles. And these are, are concrete principles which can be explained and explored in a lot of detail, but it's the idea of a layered model of the internet. The internet's constructed in different layers which provide services uh, within and between each other. It's uh, comp comprised of a network of independent networks. Networks join the internet, new networks join without anyone giving them permission to do so. It's free and open. And there's an end-to-end -end principle which is still being maintained, which is that in principle, we want any point on the internet to be able to reach any other. And these are the things that as are, as are described in this paper that lead to the dimensions of success, of scalability, flexibility, adaptability, and, and resilience. So there's a few, a few ways we can, um, we can drill down into these. The, the de design principles that, were, that, that come from the ideals are um, also central to the, to the internet's um, development and, and quite useful concepts. The, the, layering, uh, infrastructure, the layering of the infrastructure between the, the fundamental underlying network of networks itself, the network of networks, and then through those layers and through the uh, decentralized um, network of autonomous networks to the end-to-end -end principle that says that a user, doesn't matter how many networks are in between, but a user on one network can traverse the internet to another one and use their applications uh, in an end-to-end -end manner to, uh, to communicate with, it, with each other. Scalability, um, the internet is scalable in its architecture, in its operational and business models, which has enabled it to grow um, quickly without, uh, with very few um, constraints. Uh, so uh, what we see here is simply um, another version of that uh, chart you saw before of the, the population of the internet. There are other uh, very interesting ways in which the internet is scaled, for instance, from about 15,000 autonomous networks to more than 75,000 autonomous networks over that, that 20 year period. Uh, the, the number of addresses, the number of address blocks on the internet has also grown uh, astronomically. And all of this has happened without users realizing or knowing that change, dramatic change is, is continually underway. The flexibility of the internet protocols to run over underlying networks. And this chart is quite interesting because it shows over just since the year 2000, the, um, the, the coming and going, the, the ebb and flow of different technologies which carry the internet, the analog networks, which came and were dominant uh, in the early 2000s have, have gone completely. Uh, DSL came and went, mobile wireless went through a huge growth and is, is still, it's, it's, it's sort of hit the, hit the peak in terms of its um, almost global distribution. Um, and there are others as well, but all of these things have happened, they've come and gone again uh, without the internet being affected. Adaptability is the idea of providing new, new and growing um, applications. So the way the web has been delivered, uh, HTTPS for security went dramatically from 20 to 80% in, in the space of four years. We've got Quick, which is another delivery mechanism for applications. And then we've got the resilience of the internet. So. It's been, the internet really has been shown to be resilient um, over time. It stems from the, the uh, from all of these things, but from the, the distributed nature of the routing protocols and the, the operational practices and the methods that have been developed over time uh, by the engineering operational community to, uh, to bring this, um, this stable growing uh, functional uh, infrastructure to all of us. So Sylvia is giving me a nod here, but we, we sort of move on here into looking at, at the sort of governance tensions that are around all of this. So there's, there's one here, a, um, a very good uh, example between governments and internet giants in terms of the, um, the provision of, uh, of the, the management of content and the way that the governments might, might um, respond to that uh, growth in, in um, different ways that content is managed and distributed through by the, by the gigantic internet companies, but there's many more uh, elements of interplay between governance and, and the actual network that, uh, that exist uh, today, of course. Uh, the multilateral and multi-stakeholder worlds have been, uh, have been kind of at each other for, for a long time, and they still are. Um, the transition of the IANA functions was good, but um, there's a need for a lot more. Now, um, I just wanted to illustrate here that um, across the whole range of, of uh, fora, and processes that are contributing to internet governance. There's really a lot going on. 
Um, we, we're hoping that uh, that these things won't continue to diversify, but that the future will will bring us all together in a towards a happy conclusion um, in amongst all of this. Um, but I think the the important conclusions are are that you know the current internet with its outstanding success, in spite of its imperfections, which are absolutely um, abundant, uh, has been successful because of certain really really practical, existing, explicable. Um, and also manageable um, uh, underlying um, underlying features, and um, and that is that's created what, what we deal with. So as, as the internet continues to to evolve, um, recognizing and maintaining the the success factors based on guiding ideals, design principles is really is really a, a, a critical thing to understand in in looking forward as the internet as the internet continues to evolve. So. The URL is there. It's too long to remember, probably, but I can help if anyone would like to um, to get a copy of that. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, now we are going to start uh, moving into the conversation between the panelists and the audience. And I would like to start look. Oh, we'll start looking at you and see who has their hand up to have questions and um, someone from the remote participation. If there is any comments or questions from remote participation, please. Let me know. Um, to break the ice a little bit, I would like to um, ask all the panelists uh, to reflect, a, you know, like a kind of X mode, is tweet mode. Do we say tweet anymore? Anyway, um, connecting these to the theme of the global IGF, that is about the internet we want and empowering all people. From your perspective, from each of your uh, stakeholder groups and the kind of work that you uh, play in this space, what do you think are the, the challenges or the, the things that you from your organizations would like to see in the governments of our region to support the development of standards uh, in the region? And we're gonna start in a different order. So Nigel, if you hear me and you're around, would you mind to start first? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so this is a, uh, a tweet. It used to have 144 characters or something like that. <laughs> so the global IGF is the opportunity, is the real focus, is the area where we could all come together to discuss these these issues. The IGF is 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 has the ability through not just the the global meeting in Kyoto, which many of us are really looking forward to, but through the uh, national and regional networks, through the youth networks, to really connect people together to ensure that we understand what is happening in the digital technology space, to hear from experts like Peter and others that have spoken today. So it, it is really a fulcrum that we must keep. We mustn't just have these discussions at the UN. Yes, we must just as have them at the UN. We mustn't just have these between governments. We must have them with all stakeholders. Thank you, Nigel. Then I'm gonna to move to Bron. Sure, I'm gonna talk about something completely different that I guess hasn't come up here yet, which is the challenge of knowing whether you're communicating with a real human being or not. We're, we're in, in a situation where the world is about to flip to non-humans being able to appear human very, very easily conversationally. Um, and that's gonna be an ongoing challenge for us, keeping an open internet, keeping the open ability to communicate with anybody in the world. Well, I think I've hit my 140 characters, but if I pay $8, I can keep talking, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> I think I've covered it. Thank you, Ron. Now I'll pass it to Paul. They, they, they talk about the internet as a utility. Um, and I think that's, that's very relevant because we take our utilities for granted. Um, we always expect that we turn the tap on and, um, and water will flow. And mostly that's the case, but there are plenty of counter examples around the world where uh, water supplies have been polluted, uh, not deliberately, but as unintended consequences of, um, of, of interfering with aquifers, um, climate change and so on. And I, and I just think that what, um, what we want, maybe we don't want end users to, to, to be um, too uh, paranoid about that possibility, but we need to understand that, the, that what we take for granted about the internet as a utility uh, seems to be something we can take for granted. 
It served us very well through COVID, for instance, uh, but uh, the internet uh, in 20 years time could be, could be changed. The utility function and quality could be changed as a result of unintended consequences of other things that people do quite, quite deliberately and for good intentions around the, uh, around the uh, aquifers of the internet. Thank you. I think the question was really on uh, you know, the regional voices as well and how, uh, whether they're participating and if they're finding challenges on this. So I think I'll, I'll just home in down on the Pacific Islands region where I have been doing a lot of engagement. I think uh, I can say that it's not, one of a ch not much of a challenge to developing countries when they participate in these forums, but from the Pacific, uh, you know, with their small size and under resources, uh, it is a real challenge uh, for their voices to be heard. But, you know, within the ICANN space, we're doing something about it where we've managed to bring a lot of them to be members of ICANN GAC. Uh, but I think even though they're not actively participating, we think that, you know, they, they could do more. Uh, they, they're receiving the communiques and all that, but to really, we want their voices to be really heard and, and uh, there's something that we have to deal with. Thank you, Sawe. Um... Well, I'm going to take a minute as a moderator to just make a comment of my personal experience on standards use and adoption. And it's this thing about not being an English, you know, mother tongue speaker, and then trying to develop websites back when I was in my 20s and using HTML from, you know, copy and paste on text edit to try to bring organizations in Latin America to have a presence online. If it wasn't for standards and if it wasn't for that guidance on how to write those web pages in an easier way, it would have been impossible for someone that didn't speak English at the time to, or doesn't speak English yet, to be able to, to do it in a, in, a, in a good way. And I think that that brings a lot of power to bring voices heard when you have the, the chances to participate in that, in that space. One challenge for developing countries is the assumption that innovation only happens where there is a lot of money and resources and how what are the tensions between innovation and interoperability which companies like fastly uh, will probably you know face at at, um, at different uh, times and other innovators and, and uh, um, startups that are uh, trying to grow in the market in the same in asia pacific with so many languages when startups that work in korea will struggle to uh, operate in other markets just because of the language and how, how that relates to culture. So I, I am going now, now I'm gonna open the, the floor for the, the audience. I don't see any hands up. So please help me out here. We're trying to have a, a dialogue. So is anyone, um, and if not, I'm gonna pass a question to Edmund so you can break the ice from properly. Sorry, I was just distracted briefly there, but um, uh, I, I, I guess the, uh, the follow, following this, because I was sending something to, to my colleague over there. Um, can, sorry. Ah, okay. No problem. I guess one of the, the, the challenges of uh, uh, it for, for this room and, and especially the parliamentary track is what are the balances between, you know, uh, um, the, the, the technology side that Paul, you mentioned that uh, is the success factors, but how, well, how, how not to mess up the, uh, uh, the, 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 the situation as we go, go forward, because um, one of the things is that um, as we develop and as uh, um, I think uh, Bron uh, mentioned, it, there are issues that um, uh, needed to be uh, potentially uh, regulated or, or, or protection of certain uh, consumers. Uh, but where does, you know, where, where do we draw that line and how, how do we uh, ensure that those success factors are not compromised? By those, uh, I guess, uh, good efforts to 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 put forward um, uh, protections. Well, I, I think with a, a lot of diligence and care, and I, I did have an interesting discussion this afternoon with someone who was, um, for, uh, as a first newcomer here, um, commented to me that this whole process seems really slow. 
And I guess they were kind of thinking that it might run at internet speed, this mythical idea of, of uh, things moving, moving um, super fast. Um, and I kind of said, well, yes, that's true. Things take, things can take years to change, but it's probably a good thing because it really is a process of giving uh, everyone who can or who might need to want to or actually not want to but should have a say in uh, in what's um, in what's actually happening to have their have to have their say and I really think we're dealing with very uh, big and serious and potentially um, dire un I, I don't want to be too um, you know dramatic about this but sort of dire unintended, unintended consequences on something that um, that has worked uh, very well for the last 30 years so I, I think the um, the time factor and the, delib the deliberation and, um, and consideration is just really, really important. Thank you, Paul. Sally or Bron, do you want to react to that question? Yeah, um, a good analogy I've found for a lot of things that is, is office buildings, that the infrastructure is changed at different speeds in different parts of it. I, my office is inside an office building. We had our floor redecorated when we moved in uh, but the lifts are the same lifts that were there when the building was first created. And the foundations, obviously, are the same foundations that were put in when the building is created. Different parts are refreshed on different cycles. So responding to the, the speed thing, there are some things that you'll refresh quite fast. Obviously, you don't replace the fire systems on a whim. You have to make sure they're continuing to function throughout. But you can rearrange a meeting room or move the furniture around inside a particular office fairly trivially. So looking at which level of the infrastructure you're operating within is a really important way of, of looking at that. Are you changing something that's fundamental to a lot of things or are you changing something that, that has a fairly contained impact? Thank you, Ron. I have a question from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I, I have a comment to make. Uh, my name is uh, Omar, and uh, I work with the uh, EPNEC Foundation, but I'm speaking uh, for myself. Um, the, my previous job was uh, with the Afghanistan's regulatory authority. Before that, I was in business, but at the same time, I worked with many um, civil society organizations that were working on uh, promoting technology and internet um, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, the, in my last job, uh, one of the biggest issues I had as a regulator was with the parliament. Uh, we were reporting more uh, to the parliament than uh, doing the actual work. Um, so that was because of the understanding of the parliamentarians, you know, the advanced technology, um, uh, you know, concepts and, 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 and so much, and, and the new technologies that are coming up. Um, secondly, the understanding on how regulation works, what's the difference between policy regulation and then, you know, the standards and what the industry uh, needs. Uh, so uh, a huge gap, and that's why I welcome this this uh, this track. Uh, I think this will help um, the regions, uh, you know, in in the region, uh, uh, the parliamentarians to understand and engage with the with the technology. Um, there are a few. In addition, there are a few uh, uh, other things that I believe this session is uh, very important and uh, can can play a role there. Um, number one is uh, Nigel's um, comment about the government being uh, the consumer. Uh, I think the government is the biggest consumer, and uh, that's why it's important for the government in a parliament uh, to, to uh, engage with, the, uh, with both civil society and the industry. Uh, the uh, uh, digital infrastructure requires uh, it can, uh, you know, a, a good policy. For example, uh, we did not have an open access policy in Afghanistan for um, decades, and that's how the infrastructure uh, building was was pretty slow. The government could not uh, address the gap uh, in the industry. Did not have the license uh, 
you know, to, to be able to invest in that area. Until 2017 or 16, that when we first had this open access policy, and that's when the government started working on regulations on how to give licenses to the industry so they can invest on infrastructure. So uh, a big need for all of us uh, to work together. And I appreciate the fact that this um, track has been started and uh, the great views and, and thank, ideas. Thank you, thank you Omar. Um, I'm looking around and see if anyone else has a hand up, please. And can you please say your name and affiliation? Um, oh, there you go. Oh, geez. Oh. Um, I think my question is mostly directed to Mr. Wong Wan. I don't know if any policymaker wants to um, answer, that's okay. Um, it's sort of a long standing feature of the mainstream um, narrative that policymakers and lawmakers shouldn't develop legislation that stalls progress or innovation. Um, in that sense, I have two questions. What is the time span that we should be working on? Um, sort of in 2016 was, it was said that the GDPR would slow innovation. Nevertheless, in 2022, we had a boom of AI and generative AI. So um, I just wonder what, what are your takes on the time spans in this? Thank you. So this, your, your question is time span for how? How, how, how should we measure um, whether a legislation stalls innovation? Why is the time frame that we should be looking at? I'm not looking for a year, but seven years, oh, man, 10 that years, is, that years. is uh, <laughs> That is a very difficult question. I, I can't even begin to answer it really. Uh, it depends, right? This is the answer for anything like that. It, it depends what, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to look at specific examples and try and come up with a specific example. Is your legislation stalling innovation? Mostly it will be they, they, they claim that the internet sees censorship as damage and routes around it. If people are not doing business in areas with your legislation, that, that's going to be a clear sign that it is stalling them from wanting to do it. Whether that's a good or a bad thing obviously depends on, on whether what they're doing is good or bad for your people. Um, but largely it's, it's do, you, do you have the power to push things, things through as well? You can certainly disconnect yourself from the world, um, but if you're a small enough area that companies will just avoid you, then you can wind up in a situation where you're left behind. So, and the other question is, can people inside your country operate in the rest of the world? Um, because if your legislation makes it hard for your citizens to sell to the rest of the world, then you'll discover that they are not managing to export. And that's also going to be a real challenge, but timeframes, I can't answer that question. Certainly not off the cuff. But thank you for the question. It's really, really important question and good to think about. Um, I see Nigel has his, uh, his hand up, but so I guess he has a, a response as well. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. And just, just two very, very brief points. One, I, I think that's an excellent question. And you, and, and you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, the GDPR and, uh, you know, sometimes regulation has to be innovative as well and you know it, it has a it has an effect on on innovation but you know innovation of course is is is, is crucially important but has to be balanced against other public policy uh, in, in interests and and so i think you know governments have have a, have a responsibility there and also of course parliamentarians and 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 you know i wanted to just 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 make the point that you know it's so good that uh, you know we we have uh, we have this session with parliamentarians because you know it's parliamentarians that that uh, that you know hold the hold, hold the reins here to an extent in in keeping governments to an to an account you know and you know what I said about you know digital standards and internet governments you know parliamentarians have a role in in in, in questioning where governments are going and 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 ensuring that. You know the, the 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 direction is 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 reflects you know the benefits of all the society. So it's so good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I would like to spin that question a little bit and, and throw it to Sabe to see if if those timeframes are 
I don't know, expected in, in Silicon Valley at a specific pace in the briefings from technology companies are coming to the US government or you know OECD economies, what will be the pace for Pacific Island nations to actually catch up with those briefings that are happening when, when Pacific Island uh, countries can get into that train of that next change that already happened when it's coming this way? very difficult to answer as well because uh, in the pacific they have varying levels of participation some countries in the pacific or uh, in the region are quite advanced than others so can't lump them all together so uh, i think one of the things that uh, we found out very early when we did some capacity development in the region uh, to talk about ICANN and the way they could participate in ICANN was that uh, you know they, they they want to track what's going on but maybe they will not participate but they want to find a champion in the region that could follow the, the the discussions and then alert them that if they need to come in and if really mattered that they would come in and, and provide some feedback and then also participate in at that level so um, in terms of openly participating and discussion discussing and uh, being active uh, they might be holding back because of again the challenge of the resources that they have um, you know, and there's one person could be doing multiple tasks within a government ministry, so they really don't. And, and there's not only one agency, but many agencies that they have to deal with, and that's a reality. And back to you, Paul, with the, the yes, with the you know innovations around routing and automatization, you know, the issues for to assist small governments or small companies to catch up with the next thing that they need to be doing. What have you seen in that space that can be given a little bit of um, context to parliamentarians what they need to prepare? That's that's difficult. That's a difficult question. Uh, so um, look, I, th I think um, I, I won't answer that one because I don't quite understand, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll um, on the timing, I thought it was, um, it's a very interesting question because innovation is, is absolutely linked to timing. And I've sort of seen two, two different things this week. Uh, at the beginning of the week, there's a, a guy whose name I forget from Atlassian, who said that Atlassian started 20 years ago and in the internet of today, he doesn't think it would be possible, which was kind of depressing. Um, it's about competition. It's about um, the barrier to entry being higher and higher. But then I had a much a much happier conversation with Bron today. Um, not a new company, but one that's much much smaller, one that's uh, providing services globally, fifty staff I think, yeah. providing services globally, uh, contributing to the standards process, which I think is incredibly um, and impressive and something with real impact. And so I kind of could see um, that there are different views, and maybe I think Bron had some sort of clear asks for parliamentarians uh, earlier, but I think really recognizing barrier to entry and time to market and time required for innovation is um, and the stable environment that people need to be able to work in uh, to innovate is really um, is really an important an important issue for us here if that helps one more question on that sorry can, can i just make a, a sort of observation i suppose one of the things that struck me listening to this and i think um and reinforced having as I said, spent the last couple of days in Papua New Guinea with um, ministers from the Pacific, is for us to keep in mind in a sense that 20 years ago, the lots of countries were at the same, roughly the same starting point in terms of engagement with and understanding and it, with the, you know, in terms of the information society. But the speed with which we have moved since then has been different for different countries. So the information society divide, as it were, if I can sort of create a crude concept, has got much, much wider. And the, diff the danger or the, you know, the important thing for us to realise, you know, for a country like Australia perhaps to realise is where we're at in that information society journey and the sorts of things we might want to talk about and even the sorts of things we might be worried about in terms of what the future looks like are very different from a small country which is still grappling with the underlying connectivity piece. So they, we've got over that hump of getting our society on the internet 
we, but we all started from the same starting point. We've got over that hump of getting basically, you know, very close to universal access. But a bunch of other countries are still grappling with that problem. And there's sort of a risk, I suppose the question, one of the questions I'm thinking about in this context is how do we keep the global multi-stakeholder conversation going in a world where there's greater divergence on some dimensions between the participants, greater divergence than there was when we started the conversation. Thank you, Richard. Um, would you mind to say your full name and association for the transcript? You didn't say. Sorry, Richard Windia from Deputy Secretary in the Department with the longest name in the Commonwealth in Australia. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, we only have three minutes left of this panel. Uh, and unless I see hands going up, I'm just going to go back to one of the slides that Paul presented, where he talked about the design principles of layering and then guiding ideals about openness and dimensions of success. And I guess if we apply those um, to the actual dialogues that are able to you know, happen when people from private sector, technical community, the civil society and governments come together, if we apply at least some of those principles into the conversations that we're doing, then I think we are in a, in a good run for the next 30 years of internet development, but we need to um, recognize the good and work on improving, uh, understanding the things that are not working. I'm not gonna say that they're bad, we just don't understand them yet. And then try and figure out together what it means to, to move over the, the next hump. I've got one other specific thing I'd like to say if yeah. I could. Um, something that didn't make it onto my slides, but I think is, is quite valuable. Um, something that's been seen in the US is that cities that have open data have more innovation. If you can get government data uh, and build on top of it, a lot of innovation comes from that. So providing more, as, as much as you can, consumable data about uh, opening up your government data to your citizens to build on top of is, is really valuable. There's a question in the chat, uh, with vast usage of AI, what happens to career holders in the IT industry? Uh, is their future stable? No one's future is ever stable, unfortunately. <laughs> if, you, if you're the buggy whip manufacturers, when the car replaced the horse, your future is not stable. Um, so we're we're certainly in a time of change. But I think the open data is probably a thing that's going to be really useful to let your people build on top of things. So just wanted to add that one in. Thank you, Ron. And just to close the panel, I would well, you gave your final remark, <laughs> so now I'm passing on to Sally. Any final messages for the parliamentarians in the track to reflect? I think we need to continue to advocate for the multi-stakeholder model, uh, try to I know, replicate some of the discussions that are going on at the global, regional, at the national level as well, and really support that movement. Can I start with Apple? Any final comments for the parliamentarians? Actually, I'm going to be on the next panel, so I'll talk about that. But uh, I think one of the things I, uh, uh, I'm, as Paul was uh, presenting, I think that framework is really useful for um, when we think about even policies, um, you know, different levels of policies, not to mention uh, legislature and uh, and regulations by, by government. I think that is really at the core of what need we, we need to protect. So uh, I, I'm going to use that. Um, this is the second time I see this presentation, but this is the first time I can tick it down actually. <laughs> and I will be using that quite a bit into the future, I think. So two quick comments. One is I think the education of uh, parliamentarians remains important. Um, if the people making, making the laws and making the regulations don't understand the thing about which they are making those laws, that you know, does run the risk of um, ending up with not brilliant laws. Uh, so that obviously is a thing. I mean, that actually goes for policymakers um, as well, to be honest. The other... Um, uh, the other thing I would say is I think the other question that faces policymakers and parliamentarians is understanding in an economy that is increasingly digitised that it's no longer about thinking about what laws or regulations you are making for the internet. It's understanding that in a sense laws you might make in all sorts of dimensions may in some way or another touch upon a service that is delivered using the internet and therein may have some link to technical characteristics of the internet. So, you know, there's a lot of law that touches the internet in lots of, many economies now without possibly knowing it. Thank you. 
Well, I hope, I hope this has been useful in terms of information or education, if you like. I don't quite like to use the, the term, but it's, uh, it's a two-way communication. I hope this has been useful. Um, different parts of the tech community more or less are, do, are spending as much time as we can on this, on this uh, effort. And I just want to, I'll put Raj Singh on the spot uh, here. Um, we heard before that IETF is going to be held in Brisbane. Uh, the Internet Society has run a policy makers track inside IETF, uh, which is exactly to bring more and more uh, depth of, of um, content. Is it happening in Brisbane, Raj, in, in March? I don't know. Okay, I pressed this one. Right, couldn't figure out which one to press. My apologies. Um, yes, we um, since in-person meetings have come back, we have revived it indeed. And this year, you had that one, and of course, Ian was there as well up in uh, Yokohama. Um, and so next year for Brisbane, we are also intend intending to do the same thing. And I'm hoping that we can also put a bit more focus on our Pacific colleagues in particular as well as in Australia and New Zealand. You know, I think we may find the same issues as we did with APRF GF this year with people coming from, let's say, South Asia, Southeast Asia, due to distance, time, travel, money, et cetera. But uh, hopefully we can again focus on the Pacific part of the Asia Pacific region. Thanks for flagging that. Thank you very much. And I think with that, if we can close the panel. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And thank you all for your great comments. Thank you. Is anyone going to the lectern? Anyone use the lectern for Jenny? I'll give her that.